Today, we're joined by Dr. John Eisen, who's a hospital medicine physician at Massachusetts General Hospital and instructor in medicine at Harvard Medical School, as well as an associate at the MGH Center for the Environment and Health. Dr. Christian Maywalt, who's a hospital medicine physician at Mass General and an associate at the MGH Center for the Environment and Health. Jennifer Sargent, the nursing director of MGH Phillips House. Latoya Brewster, who is the Director of Environmental Services at MGH, Chair of the Association of the MGH Multicultural Professionals, and a, an Associate at the MGH Center for the Environment and Health. And also on their team is Dennis Boger, who couldn't join us today. Dennis is the Operations Manager for the MGH uh, Department of Patient Care Services and Clinical Support Services. As background, Christian and Jonathan physically performed the waste audit. Jen was integral in the logistical preparation, including providing ultimate approval for the audit and securing the Phillips 21 solarium for waste collection. Latoya and Dennis helped coordinate the temporary change in waste disposal pathways during the 24 hour waste collection period. So uh, next slide, please, Clint. And we want to share the upcoming events that we have. Our next Grand Rounds webinar is, the title is Clinical Leaders as Drivers of Sustainability, a Physician Researcher Perspective. And uh, Dr. Jonathan Slutsman will join us. And uh, we'll also have the topic of waste reduction, recycling, and circular economy opportunities. And Latoya Brewster and a, an esteemed team will join us. And then please mark your calendars as well for a virtual symposium, Climate Change in Health 2022, a roadmap for grassroots advocacy on Saturday, April 9th from 8.30 to 12.30. Bill McKibben will be joining us along with representatives Ayanna Presley, a US Congresswoman in the House of Representatives and uh, La Representative Lauren Underwood, uh, one of the lead co-sponsors of the Black Momnibus legislation fo focused on, um, uh, on uh, health and climate change, as well as other issues around uh, BIPOC populations health. Uh, now to Jonathan's slides, please. And we welcome our interprofessional team. Thank you, John and company. Thank you, Patrice. Uh, I think Christian's going to pull up the slides in just a second, uh, but just wanted to say thank you for the invitation and uh, for the opportunity to, to share our work. Uh, so I'll just pull it up here. Perfect. So um, just moving on to the next slide, just the brief disclosure statement. We have no financial disclosures. Um, and then on to our outline. Um, before I turn over to Christian, um, just a very brief introduction on sort of uh, healthcare and its impact on climate change. Also discussing sort of uh, the plastic impact and the impact of the pandemic as well. Uh, we'll then jump into our waste audit, what a waste audit is, um, the objectives and the logistical planning of our, our waste audit and leading into our results and some of the conclusions that we came to. And finally, a discussion on the implications and future directions at MGH, MGB and beyond. And um, then we'll open up for questions. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Christian. Uh, go ahead. Hi, uh, it's nice to see you all this morning. Um, and uh, Patrice, thank you for inviting us to come talk. Um, so I, as I was thinking about how to put these slides together, I wondered if I should wait until the end to give the punchline away, which is uh, inpatient medicine produces an enormous amount of waste. And of that waste, a lot of it is plastic. Um, I decided that it was better to, uh, to sort of end with the punchline and or begin with the punchline and let you all know that that's where we're gonna end up and help contextualize why we should care about uh, plastic production uh, and waste. 
So as you all know, plastic is uh, ubiquitous within the United States, and that's because it's extremely useful. It is durable, it's inexpensive, it is strong for how uh, little it weighs, and so it is permeated through virtually all um, areas of uh, the United States um, systems. Um, the United States is the largest producer of plastic waste per capita in the world. Uh, production is increasing. And a few stats which I think help to contextualize how much plastic is produced currently. Uh, more than half the plastic ever made was made in the last 15 years. Uh, roughly a trillion plastic bags are produced yearly um, with an average working life of around 15 minutes. Um, and plastic uh, persists in the environment for centuries, um, estimated for at least 450 years. And healthcare is a particularly um, energy intensive and plastic or in waste intensive uh, sector. Um, and that's largely because of a reliance on single use products. Um, and one estimate uh, uh, indicated that roughly 5 million tons of waste are produced within the healthcare industry alone. <clears throat> so next I'm gonna try to uh, talk about, um, because we're healthcare providers, we should be particularly concerned about the consequences of uh, of the uh, care that we deliver um, and how that impacts public health. And unfortunately, plastic uh, affects uh, health at both the both ends of its life cycle, the production side as well as the waste side. On the production side, there are two main areas in which it can impact health. One is with greenhouse gas emissions and the second is with the chemicals required to actually produce the plastic pellets and subsequent plastic products. <clears throat> So uh, this slide here is from uh, St. James Parish in Louisiana, which I'll talk about um, shortly. So of course, plastic is made from petroleum. Uh, roughly 12% of all glo global oil uh, used in the um, world is for plastic production. Uh, it's expected that plastic will um, create, uh, will generate more greenhouse gases than coal by the year 2030. In part, that's because of uh, reduction in the amount of coal that's used for um, for energy production, but also uh, because of an increased uh, utilization of plastic. The U.S. healthcare system also produces a lot of greenhouse gases. Um, roughly 10% of the United States um, uh, greenhouse gas emissions come from healthcare, um, and a significant portion of this can be associated with our waste production. Um, and as I mentioned, this is getting uh, bigger and bigger as a problem. Uh, in the last three years, uh, 42 plastic facilities uh, opened in the United States, and many of them are in this area of St. James Parish uh, in what is termed Cancer Alley. So a little bit about Cancer Alley and a focus on sort of the, the um, uh, non-greenhouse gas portion of, of plastic production. So Cancer Alley is a, a term for a stretch of about 40 miles um, between New Orleans and Baton Rouge and Louisiana. This is an aerial view. Um, it is extremely concentrated with petrochemical facilities. Um, this slide is from ProPublica in 2020, um, and it just shows that uh, in the United States, if a, um, if a chemical facility releases a certain amount of toxic chemicals into the environment, they are required to report to the EPA exactly how much they produced. Um, and between 1988 and 2017, there was about a 25% reduction in the number of facilities that were required to report. And so nationwide, we're actually getting much better, except for Louisiana, where there's been about a 25% increase. Um, and virtually all of that growth is related to petrochemical um, facilities, specifically with plastics. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this region uh, earned the name Cancer Alley because of an association with an increased risk of uh, cancer and also with uh, preterm labor and miscarriage. These are all um, important, I think, outcomes for, for us as healthcare providers. And I think particularly sinister is this area, in particular St. James Parish, which is the largest uh, community in this stretch, um, is a um, heavily African-American community. And the United uh, Nations Human Rights Council last year uh, called this environmental racism because of um, 
uh, sort of increased uh, utilization of um, poor and uh, 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 people of color communities um, to, to place all of these facilities. So that's the production side. On the, on the waste side, <clears throat> I think before John and I really started working on this, I had this impression that of course it all gets recycled and it's totally fine. Um, but I think we realized very quickly that that is a myth. Uh, in the United States, as of 2018, only about 9% of plastic is recycled. And that's because of uh, two main problems. One, plastics are uh, made of multiple different polymers, and it can be very difficult for uh, the recycling centers to disentangle the polymers, and not all of them are equally recyclable. <clears throat> and then the second is there is often a reduction in the quality of the plastic at each stage. So for example, a Coke bottle um, on cycle one may be turned into a plastic bag on cycle two that cannot then be recycled. Um, so it's not renewed again and again and again. You'll notice that this graph, this is from the EPA, it ends in 2018. After 2018, it gets even bleaker. And that's because uh, up to 2018, um, virtually all of the plastic waste uh, produced on the sort of Western half of the United States was shipped to China. And the reason for that is because of the trade deficit, China sent more goods to the United States and then had difficulty getting their ships back because they lacked any ballast. And so they were willing to take our waste um, to recycle it in their own facilities. But in 2018, they implemented a set of policies called Green Fence, uh, which essentially banned the import of all plastic waste uh, throughout the world. And since that time, it's been very difficult for uh, the United States in particular, but countries around the world to figure out what they were gonna do with their plastic waste. So now most of it ends up in landfills. Um, if it's on the surface and exposed to UV radiation, plastic can degrade into methane and ethylene, which are potent uh, greenhouse gases. And then I think we're all familiar that uh, plastic also often leaches into our groundwater, <clears throat> the rivers, and subsequently into the global ocean where it contaminates our water supply and impacts, um, impacts the uh, uh, marine life. So John and I were particularly interested in how has COVID impacted this? We had this impression that it seems like we're using more plastic waste, but we wanted to try to quantify that. So a little context on COVID. Um, and I'll break this into hospital-based care related to COVID, and then just globally, how has COVID affected plastic waste? So for that first part about how has uh, uh, COVID affected the policies regarding plastic, um, because of concerns about cross-contamination, many uh, communities that had previously passed legislation to try to reduce the amount of single-use plastic um, referred or revoked or deferred or revoked those bans. And so New York, Oregon, California, all paused plastic bag bans. <coughs> United Kingdom, Canada, and Portugal uh, all deferred similar bans. Um, one uh, modest success was in California. They just passed this truth and labeling for recyclable materials bill. And so um, I think we're all familiar with the, the triangle with the encircling uh, arrows um, and a number inside that is intended to show what the uh, plastic um, polymer that is used in whatever product uh, is. Um, and I had the impression that because that ring was there, uh, all of this was recyclable. In truth, it really only indicates what the polymer is, and only one and two <clears throat> are typically recyclable in the United States. Um, three through seven are virtually always disposed of. And so in California, you can now only use the encircling rings if it is a, a widely um, re recyclable polymer, so really just only one and two. And this is relevant for the plastic uh, waste that John and I found in our waste audit. Um, so for hospital-based care, COVID has also impacted the amount of waste that we produce. <clears throat> there have been surging number of hospitalizations, uh, there's more testing, and um, there is a substantial increase in the amount of PPE required to deliver hospital-based care. There are early reports from Wuhan 
um, which showed roughly a twofold increase in uh, waste production per inpatient. Um, and that was primarily uh, because of an increased reliance on PPE. And this is a, a study from the uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. This was published just two months ago, which is a model um, trying to look at the amount of waste that increased plastic waste that was produced uh, during the COVID-19 <coughs> pandemic and what was the source of that increased waste production. And so in this model, they looked at um, hospital-based care, uh, home test kits, home surgical masks, home uh, N95s, and then packaging. Uh, more pay people are um, ordering delivery to their home specifically rather than going to grocery stores or um, other, other areas of shopping. And in their model, they found a dramatic um, increase in the amount of uh, waste produced generally, but especially, like virtually all of that was coming from hospital-based care. Um, <clears throat> This is a map that shows each of those sectors um, and then the total amounts of plastic. The increased uh, circles showcase uh, more plastic waste uh, permeating into our, um, into the global uh, uh, ocean. And then red is uh, intended to indicate a greater amount of uh, plastic waste production. And this slide, I really just wanted to in, um, indicate that this is not a problem specific to the United States, it's everywhere um, and has become an increasing concern, I think, for our patients and for the way that we deliver care. So with that, I'll pass it over to John. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Christian, and uh, thank you for setting the stage. Um, and now kind of moving on to our waste audit in particular and sort of understanding what a waste audit really is. Um, and so the waste audit really serves a couple purposes. One is to comprehensively quantify <clears throat> characterize waste generated in a particular setting, whether that's healthcare or otherwise, and then ultimately to identify pathways for improvement in waste generation, diversion, and elimination. Um, and so as I mentioned, these have been utilized in a number of different settings, whether it's healthcare delivery or otherwise, but none have really specifically focused on inpatient medicine units. And as Christian alluded to, you know, there is some limited data and I think anecdotally some evidence that um, waste is changing and increasing in light of the pandemic, but the specific information uh, in the United States is, is fairly limited. Uh, next slide. Uh, before we uh, jump into ours, I wanted to mention and give credit to uh, a waste audit that was actually performed at MGH several years ago in the MGH emergency department uh, with Jonathan Slutsman and a couple other colleagues listed there. Uh, and this was a 24 hour uh, collection period of all waste, including municipal solid waste, which is what we most commonly think of as non-recyclable waste, regulated medical waste, which uh, by Massachusetts state law is defined as contaminated biohazardous or infectious material. Uh, and then recycling uh, in the emergency room. Um, and the sort of the goal, the, the metrics of that waste audit were really um, not only sort of identifying total mass of waste, but categorizing waste by raw material and then further um, cataloging and identifying waste based on prevalent items. And ultimately, this is, as I mentioned in the prior slide, would hopefully help with areas for improvement. So one of the uh, potential areas for improvement identified in this audit was helping to reduce the inaccurate sorting and disposal of municipal solid waste that was ending up in regulated medical waste bins. Uh, so moving on. And so the, the key points thinking about our waste audit was one, medicine units are the backbone of inpatient care. We see a ton of patients, a ton of volume. And so it would make sense that we generate a lot of waste in that process. Um, Two, as mentioned previously, medical waste generation through the pandemic seems to be increasing, in particular plastic waste related to PPE. Um, but again, that has yet to be sufficiently quantified, not only in the US, but in the inpatient setting uh, where most of the PPE is being used. And then three, implementing sustainable practices can actually have a profound environmental impact and also a cost-effective impact. Uh, moving on. So our objectives were to quantify and characterize all municipal solid waste and regulated medical waste produced on an inpatient 
medicine unit in order to inform opportunities for diversion and elimination. Uh, two, to serve as a tool to extrapolate these findings to other clinical care settings, uh, whether that's intensive care unit, operating rooms, other units. And then furthermore, to serve as a template for future audits at MGH and beyond, similar to how we sort of utilized some of the framework from the MGH emergency room audit to help guide our own audit. Uh, next slide. So jumping to project design, we um, ended up solidifying a 24 hour period of waste collection during a, a weekday in August of 2021, this past August. Um, we targeted Phillips 21, which is a 20 bed single occupancy inpatient medicine unit. Um, historically, approximately three quarters of patients are on contact precautions in this unit. It's single occupancy. so. Um, it's sort of self-selecting in some ways in that sense. So um, based on our, po our hospital policy here at MGH, contact precautions are utilized for MRSA, VRE, MDRO, and COVID-19 patients. Um, and then the on-floor solarium um, was used as our waste collection and sorting space. And we'll show some pictures in a couple slides of uh, sort of the prep that was involved, uh, thanks to the, uh, Latoya and the Environmental Services team. And so um, as we sort of spoke about in the introduction, I, I can't give enough thanks to sort of everyone who's been involved uh, during the logistical planning of this um, and uh, balancing this project with maintaining a high level of clinical care and also navigating the continuous capacity disaster that is our hospital these days. So um, thank you to, to Jen uh, from the nursing standpoint uh, from Environmental Services, Latoya, from Dennis, uh, uh, who helped manage the unit operations um, in making sure that this went smoothly and there was minimal interruption to our waste disposal pathways, but also to clinical care. Um, moving on to the next slide. And so this is just a very brief sort of pathway of how things uh, were adjusted during this 24 hour collection. Uh, Christian and I started sorting the waste as uh, waste was being brought to the solarium so we could cut down on overall waste accumulation time and project time. Uh, Jonathan Slutsman was kind enough to uh, lend his uh, scale with a fidelity and capacity listed there uh, for the purpose of this waste audit. Uh, and again, you can just see the visual here of the sort of temporary change in uh, waste uh, collection and uh, distribution, uh, diversion. Uh, moving on to the next slide. And so sort of similar to the uh, MGH ED audit, we um, attempted to quantify total mass and, and distribution of waste among major categories, uh, in particular, MSW and RMW, and also by raw material. We also did identify certain items of interest that we'll talk about in upcoming slides. Um, we did not individually sort any regulated medical waste due to safety concerns. Regulated medical waste would include the red biohazard bags, or sharps containers, so we did not go uh, digging into them. And I think it's important to note that um, our audit excluded cafeteria delivered patient meals, which are separately disposed of by nutrition services, but we were able to include any external sources of food um, or unit galley food, uh, like snacks or soda cans. So we'll start here with a picture. Um, and we're going to start with the image on the top right, which is just sort of showing, showing the prep of the solarium and then some of the uh, early stages of waste collection um, that brought over to the, to the solarium. The picture just below it, and we'll talk about this in future slides, is actually looking at um, unused items that were discarded. So some of the items you can see here is an unused glove box, multiple chucks, uh, temporary stethoscopes, IV tubing, um, basin bins. So we'll talk more about that, but just a, a large amount for 24 hours. Um, and then below that is just the sharp containers. But then going to the large picture with uh, Christian there for scale, um, this was near the end of our uh, collection period. And you can see sort of the staggering amount of, in particular, gowns. Uh, plastic gowns disposed of in one day. So nearly 600 polypropylene plastic gowns were disposed of in one day. Uh, two and a half thousand plastic gloves, 86 masks, and 20 face shields and goggles. 
um, but not the next slide. So going through some of their results of our audit, we um, basically found that we had accumulated 168 kilograms, which is around 300 or so pounds of waste in a 24 hour period on Phillips 21. And nearly 90% of that waste was municipal solid waste. And more than half of the municipal solid waste was plastic. And breaking that down even further, PPE, which would include gowns, gloves, face shields, goggles, masks, accounted for nearly 70% of plastic municipal solid waste and more than one third of all the municipal solid waste. And then uh, just recapping some of the items that I'd mentioned in the um, unused but discarded uh, section, that ended up accounting for about 5% of the municipal solid waste. We did not encounter any uh, designated recycling waste. I think in my personal experience, at least a lot of floors don't have more than one, if any, sort of recycling bins. I don't know if at that time it got mixed in with other waste. We did identify um, you know, soda cans and some plastic bottles in general waste, but just a point to that as well. It was would have been fairly negligible. Uh, next slide. And again, just another visualization here um, to show you, obviously, the large green, uh, the large blue wedge here um, is reflecting plastic waste. But you can see the next largest sections are food waste in yellow, and then um, the um, unused, um, the mixed waste here, which included a number of different, different items, usually soiled um, diapers, and then beyond that, the unused items as well in the red uh, was a significant amount. Uh, moving on. And then a large sort of table here, but again, just sort of highlighting at the top, it's a breakdown of the PPE. And you can see that more than a third of the percentage of total municipal solid waste was PPE. Um, click one more time. So I'm sort of trying to roughly extrapolate this to waste per patient in one day. We use more than eight kilograms, nearly three kilograms of PPE and 28 plastic gowns per patient in one day. Again, a rough extrapolation here, but you can sort of get the sense of what we're aiming for. Uh, but all that aside, I think a picture is really worth a thousand words. And so just have one more picture here with Christian and the large amount of, of uh, plastic uh, gowns. And then to sort of put this into more layman's terms, or I guess more easily understandable terms beyond just mass, um, we use, the EPA has some calculators uh, online where we can sort of convert the amount of waste, uh, taking into account generation and elimination, convert them to greenhouse gas emissions. So as you can see here, our waste audit accounted for roughly half a metric ton of greenhouse gas emissions uh, in one day. And that is nearly equivalent to driving 1,350 miles in an average car, charging 65,000 plus smartphones, using 22 propane cylinders for home barbecues, we're burning 594 pounds of coal. So in conclusion, as Christian had mentioned, I think it's, it's fairly obvious to our audience, waste not only contaminates our planet, but it's contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. We generate a staggering amount of waste in the inpatient setting. PPE has been a problem and it's more of a problem in light of the pandemic. And the cafeteria food is probably, the cafeteria waste is probably non-negligible. Just looking back at the prior slide that showed that there was a decent amount of galley food waste, you can imagine extrapolated further how much potential food waste there is uh, from cafeteria meals. Speaking very quickly to potential limitations, um, we acknowledge that you know, Phillips 21 may have a higher proportion of precautions patients than other units. Um, and again, sort of a self-selecting unit in the sense that it's a single occupancy room. So um, that may work towards more contact patients. But I would also uh, suggest that there could be some counterbalance by the fact that there is a smaller unit census than other floors uh, on Phillips 21. And the patients on Phillips 21 tend to be very medically complex and as a result tend to have longer hospital stays. So you can imagine a less medically complex floor with a higher number of patients, but still a number of precautions patients. There's probably higher turnover and more patients on that floor at any given time. I think the last point I want to sort of 
hammer home here, and we'll talk about it in more detail in the next section, is that a waste audit can be accomplished in any setting. It's been done in MGH before. We've now done it again. It's been done in other institutions and in other non-healthcare settings. So I think that's a really key point here is that this is very achievable and very informative. And I'll pick it back up from here. When I have attended um, topics on, on the health uh, or in the environment and health, I often find that it ends on a relatively bleak note. And so we wanted to um, address some opportunities for uh, improving the amount of waste that we produce. And so um, the next section is just gonna focus on how can we mitigate our waste. And so I went to elementary school, like all of you, and so I think we know that the way to reduce our waste is, of course, to reduce, reuse, and recycle. Um, but I think what's interesting about this paradigm, uh, I'll argue this is not accurate, that the reduce, reuse, recycle is actually in um, order of importance. And so first you should reduce, after you've tried reducing, then you should reuse, after you've tried reusing, then you can recycle. And this is related, this will um, give us the best bang for our buck. And so I'm gonna use this paradigm to uh, go through our recommendations for how we might be able to reduce uh, the amount of waste that we produce um, on our hospital floors. So to reduce waste, one particularly low hanging fruit would be to eliminate single use plastic toiletries. Currently, all patients are given um, the small shampoo bottles uh, and um, uh, and like uh, individual uh, soap bars that you would expect to see in many hotels. Uh, Marriott Hotel uh, had those up until 2019 when they eliminated them in favor of the large um, soap containers that would be on the wall. And they estimated that they uh, diverted about 500 million uh, single use plastic bottles each year related to that intervention. We can also try to remind uh, the frontline staff, our nurses, um, uh, physicians, physical therapists, other um, allied healthcare uh, professionals to reduce the amount of, um, of supplies that they're using. You can imagine that part of the reason you get 10 chucks related to one patient um, patient's room is you grab 10 chucks, but maybe you only need two, but they all end up in the trash at the end. Um, and so this was an ad from uh, the Ad Council, which uh, just shows that all of these things, all of these plastics that we um, use often end up in landfills and then have the potential to contaminate our global ocean. I think one particularly uh, uh, high yield strategy would be to reduce our hospital gown usage. Um, in particular, uh, I think we could eliminate precaution gowns for MRSA and VRE. So there's no good evidence to support using precaution gowns for these indications. Um, two articles, which we've highlighted here, but there are others, show uh, no major um, improvements in the transmission of MRSA and VRE. Um, and other institutions, which I think MGH often considers peer institutions, including Beth Israel just across town or UCSF, um, in San Francisco, don't use uh, precaution gowns for either MRSA or VRE. Beyond uh, the benefits of reducing or eliminating those hospital gowns, um, you can imagine that this would improve the chronic capacity strains that MGH experiences, because if patients are no longer on contact precautions for MRSA or VRE, when they have a roommate, it would be easier to cohort, and that may make um, our uh, uh, discharge from the emergency department to the inpatient unit more efficient. And then there's good evidence to show that patients who are on contact precautions have fewer visits from their nurses and from their uh, doctors um, and uh, often experience worse care as a consequence. And so if we could eliminate these as indications for um, gowns, we uh, would see our patients more frequently and hopefully deliver better care. So how could we reuse? Um, I think, uh, again, focusing on gowns, uh, up until I think 2018 or so, uh, MGH had reusable gowns. Uh, and we switched around that time in favor of disposable gowns. And I was curious to see, well, what are the impacts of uh, reusable versus um, disposable gowns? And so there are at least six studies that looked at um, what are the environmental impacts of disposable versus uh, reusable gowns. 
And disposable gowns uh, turn out to be worse in every meaningful category. So this is one study which summarizes uh, a number of ways in which gowns could negatively impact the environment. Um, disposable gowns uh, are um, in the teal, and this is like 100%. And then uh, the percentage uh, next to that is the uh, how much waste a reusable gown would use in, in consequence or in uh, comparison. And I thought it was particularly interesting. I wasn't surprised that it used less energy. I wasn't surprised that there was a reduction in uh, carbon footprint. I was surprised that it used less water. Um, you have to wash the disposable or the reusable gowns, um, but it uh, turns out that the amount of water required to make virgin plastic is so uh, intensive that it still comes out better um, to use the to, um, reusable gowns. UCLA uh, has perhaps the most uh, successful and famous uh, reusable gown project. In 2012, they implemented a, a, a um, program to uh, switch from disposable gowns to reusable gowns. In three years, they uh, diverted about 300 tons of uh, landfill waste. And they also saw about a $1 million um, uh, savings associated with implementing reusable gowns. And you can imagine during COVID that this would be especially valuable. Um, we, I think, saw, uh, we're all familiar with the news reports of um, uh, limited PPE for healthcare professionals. And um, in 2020, Practice Green Health surveyed uh, 269 facilities ranging from community hospitals up to academic medical centers. And because of the shortages of PPE, um, a substantial proportion had to switch to uh, reusable gowns. Um, trying to cope with the shortfall of PPE uh, related to the pandemic. And uh, I'm not an economist, but I am familiar with uh, the basic construct of supply and demand. And as the supply of PPE went down, the cost of, um, of getting it went up. And the American Hospital Association found that in the first four months of the pandemic in 2020, um, hospitals spent around $2.4 billion on PPE. Um, in part, that was because they were buying more, but in part, that was because the prices were going up. And so this $1 million uh, that was saved at UCLA, you could imagine could be even higher uh, uh, in our current um, setting. So moving on to recycling, is recycling a viable option? I think there are opportunities here, although I think they're more challenging um, than I originally understood. So if you imagine our PPE, um, the goggles, the face mask, the gowns, gloves, uh, and all of the things that go into delivering care and um, uh, disentangle those into their component um, uh, polymers, um, we can see like what is recyclable uh, in most municipal um, settings, what is occasionally recyclable, and then what does not currently have any opportunity for recycling. And so you can see it's kind of a mixed bag. So green here, I've tried to highlight are the things that are typically recyclable. Purple are things that are sometimes recyclable. And then red is virtually never recyclable. And what's challenging is uh, many polymers may go into the same um, into the same product. So for example, a face mask has multiple different polymers uh, inside of it. And so pulling that apart can be a challenge. I will say, there uh, are increasing focus, or uh, there's an increasing focus on trying to recover um, the uh, some of this plastic waste um, to reuse, and in particular, um, a focus on blue wrap recycling. Um, and the classic blue wrap is the um, the wrapping that comes around surgical trays or other sterile instruments. Um, and there have been successful pilots uh, uh, recovering that and. Um, uh, being able to reutilize that. And that is uh, specifically for polypropylene. But uh, there are programs to also recover for gowns. Similarly, on um, the recycling process, after plastic, our second most, um, uh, or the second largest amount of waste was related to food waste. This is an area that um, uh, MGH has already uh, 
showed some promise. Um, I have a quote here from uh, Latoya, who is uh, so kind and helped us throughout this process. But MGH uh, already composts uh, the organic waste that is produced in the cafeterias. And so in 2020, they, uh, the, the um, cafeteria staff will sort out the organic waste. They ship it up to Maine, where it's mixed with uh, cow manure which produces biogas, which can be used for uh, energy production. And then um, the, the remainder can be used for fertilization and it's a renewable process. Um, and that was pretty successful in 2020. Uh, they were able to uh, divert greenhouse gases worth about 787 barrels of oil or the amount of electricity to, um, to uh, power 50 residential homes in that year. Um, and I, I just really like this quote from LaToya, as a healthcare organization dedicated to being as sustainable, sustainable as possible, we're thrilled that we can make sure our food waste is put to better use. And I think there's an opportunity to try to recover the food waste that's produced on the floors that doesn't make it back to the cafeteria um, to ensure that this process is as efficient as possible. So to end with um, sort of a note of optimism, uh, um, MGH has successfully implemented other waste strategies. So we had styrofoam in the cafeteria up until maybe two, three years ago. Um, that's been eliminated. The composting program, which I just talked about, has um, been implemented successfully. And I think if we were to take some of these next steps, we could uh, improve our waste production for the hospital um, uh, even more. And so to summarize, our recommendations, we say uh, it would be great to reinvest in uh, the education of frontline staff um, and ensure that um, we use um, uh, savvy maneuvers to reduce the amount of waste produced. And that could be clustering care for nurses uh, so that multiple gallons aren't used to see patients in the same room. We could eliminate MRSA and VRE as contact precautions. We could start using reusable gowns instead of disposable gowns. We could eliminate single-use um, toiletries. We can expand the composting um, pro program that has been successful in the cafeteria to include floor food waste. And I think a particular note of optimism is that MGH is now part of MGB and um, the total number of inpatients that are served by our network, only a third of them get their care at MGH. And so if any of these pilots were successful here, you can imagine that they could be rolled out at other um, sister facilities and that the impact could double or potentially triple. And a similar point, we're an academic medical center. We're charged with leading healthcare, identifying solutions for uh, some of the intractable problems that healthcare delivery um, causes. And only 14% of patients are getting their care at academic medical centers. But if we show cost savings, if we show a benefit to our communities by reducing the amount of waste produced, you can imagine that other um, hospital networks would pick up on this theme and potentially utilize the same strategies. And so with that, um, we'll end uh, by thanking our team. Maybe John, if you wanna unmute and help me with the thank yous here. Um, but I'll, I'll start by saying uh, thank you to uh, Patrice and Winnie, um, Barbara, Sue Ellen, Clint, Michael, everyone uh, from, the, um, from the Grand Rounds team who helped us put together our presentation. Um, thank you to Jonathan Slutzman uh, for his guidance on the prior waste audit um, and Otta Sekarin who helped us um, uh, get um, identify Phillips 21 as a, as a good um, source for our, our waste audit. Um, and then also thank you to the uh, MGH Center for the Environment and Health for um, sort of supporting this work. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you all so much. And um, as, as you see there as well, um, Christian and I have left our emails to for future conversations. Um, but thank you again and I really appreciate the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, John and Christian, for your presentation on behalf of your incredible team. I, I was, before we go to Sue Ellen Brakey for audience questions, I want to mention, I was really struck by the Louisiana uh, the, um, data on in, 
toxic releases that have increased while nationwide they're decreasing. And the piece on Cancer Alley, as well as um, the, the mention of um, adverse pregnancy outcomes. And there are systematic reviews that are emerging around poor air quality, in particular from pollution and combustion associated with preterm labor, stillbirth, low birth weight, and intrauterine growth restriction. And I wonder if you could share, or perhaps Latoya could share, after, after waste is collected at MGH or, or more broadly MGB, which communities is it taken to and how is it disposed of? Because that's, of course, our organization's impact in our broader community. And then we'll hand it over to Sue Ellen for questions from the audience. Yeah, so I can answer that for you, Patrice. Um, our waste is disposed of through Casella, and they actually have a plant right here in Charlestown. Thank you, Latoya. But yeah, our, our waste stays in the greater Boston area. Mm -hmm. And of course, that may impact um, the Charlestown community's health, which mm -hmm. uh, we, of course, have Mass General's Charlestown Health Center and other, other um, community centers. Chelsea is, of course, close by. But thanks, Latoya, for that. And also, thank you to the panel for ending on an optimistic note. I think it's so important that we remain hopeful about how, how each and every one of us can contribute to the challenges of sustainability and um, health consequences that are generated um, because of waste that is uh, emitted by healthcare organizations. Sue Ellen. Thanks, Patrice. Um, and I would just echo, I, I, it was eye-opening. It was a fantastic presentation. It was informative and you ended on that hopeful note, which was great. So before I go to the um, q and A, I I do wanna build on um, this idea of Cancer Alley and you talked about the health impacts. I'm wondering, especially because Louisiana can be um, hot and have a high index at certain times of the year, if there are any other data on other illnesses, like for instance, cardiopulmonary disease, um, Yeah, so I, I looked at this for some time um, and the data are slightly more mixed than I would have expected. There are studies that show um, increased cardiovascular uh, impacts uh, of the communities immediately laying around um, these petrochemical facilities. The, they're confounded a bit by Louisiana has one of the highest rates of diabetes, obesity, um, hypertension, hyperlipidemia in the country. And so while there are increased rates uh, for um, people living in that environment, there's potential confounders. Um, and it's been difficult for, I think, researchers to disentangle exactly how much is re related to the petrochemical facilities and how much is related to these other characteristics, which we know um, adversely affect cardiovascular health. Um, but I think the bulk of data would suggest that there are meaningful health consequences for the folks who live in that area. Great, thank you. Um, so one of, one of the overarching um, questions I'm seeing in the chat is about, there's some very specific questions, but one of the, one of the ideas is like, so how did you go to the hospital administration and get support to do this work? What are some what are some pearls of wisdom you have in that regard? I think um, I may start just very briefly. I think just by own sharing my own personal experience with getting involved in this. I think a year ago at this time I was barely involved in any sort of work. Um, and I think a common theme that I've noticed is there are a lot of people with similar thoughts about climate change and health and are looking to be connected to other people, but there's a, a large group of people who maybe have yet to be connected. And so for whatever reason, I think as we started talking more about this, um, you know, Christian and I connected, we connected with, with Jonathan Slutsman, he connected us to LaToya, we spoke to Jen who already had, you know, thoughts about how we can improve things from a sustainability perspective. Things sort of snowballed from that perspective because there was sort of a, um, a community, even if we weren't interconnected at that point, there was an interest in 
in making a change and making an impact. Um, and I think over the past five years globally, this has now become on everyone's mind. We can, everyone is affected by this. So, and everyone has an, is impacted by it in some way. So there is some familiarity there for any person. So I think things sort of snowballed that way. There were some challenges and, and Jen maybe can speak to that a little bit with um, our capacity issues and trying to avoid disrupting patient care while doing this audit. Um, and so there were, there were some challenges in trying to secure that space for the physical waste collection. Um, but I think the biggest takeaway was that there are a lot of other people who are interested in this. There is momentum on our side. And I think perseverance to make this happen, it's logistically beyond the person power of doing it. There's not too much else to actually doing the audit. Um, but I think there's momentum is on our side. I think perseverance is a big factor here as well, too. But I'll let some of the other, other members of our team speak. I don't want to hog the limelight. Uh, John, just to add to that, I think that senior leadership um, approval and just supporting of the initiative has been key as well. So I know that my VP, um, Sally, is a part of the center um, and supports the work that we're doing. So it's like having that uh, leadership voice behind you to say encouraging and um, approval um, helps the ease of process to say, yes, when I'm, I'm contacted by Dr. Eisen, it's already a go, like, let's work to get this, this set up and move in. Great. Did anyone else want to add anything to that question or respond? Okay. Um, Another, so I will say in the chat that we've got someone from Wentworth Douglas and someone from McLean Hospital who um, seem to be interested. And so everyone gets this, everyone will have the, um, get a link to this. And so um, John and Christian um, have put their emails out there. So I'm, you know, there might be an opportunity to do a little bit more connecting in that way. Um, Someone asked the question about, um, um, can you talk more about the next steps for your work? And um, do you have any plans for any possible quality improvement projects around this? Um, John, do you want me to talk? We're, well, at next month's Ground, ground Rounds, um, one of the initiatives that uh, Christian and John had submitted was around blue wrap recycling and we're already um, in a pilot phase we're well into a pilot um, in the ORs here in MGH so we'll be discussing that further at next month's uh, grand round session as well as um, the guys gave you an intro to uh, expanding composting there's work being done um, between EVS and nutrition currently um, in in regards to expanding so come back and join us in March <laughs> Yeah, that composting um, work that you're doing is incredible. <clears throat> so congratulations on that. Um, someone asked, well, one quick question is, did you sort continuously or did you sort at the end of the 24 hours? Uh, we started sorting uh, continuously. So as collection was occurring, we did it in sort of two large chunks throughout that period, but um, we started sorting as waste was accumulating. And I think we were all surprised by the amount um, of waste that we ended up accumulating. So I'm glad we started sorting uh, simultaneously. Yeah, it was, it was we have, um, as you pointed out before, we have 20 private rooms. And so we often get um, patients that are on isolation precautions. Um, at, on this day, um, we had 13 patients who are on isolation precautions. Um, we've had days when we've had 19, 20 patients. Um, so, so um, like I said, it's typically is three quarters. So, um, and we have made efforts to um, cluster care, you know, partner with nutrition so that um, maybe the nutrition services coordinator doesn't have to put on a gown to go into the room. Um, we do try to cluster care, but that is a tremendous, it was, it was so eye-opening, a tremendous amount of, of, of waste that's generated. We do try to not bring in extra supplies um, for this reason and also for um, 
laundry audits that we've done um, with the with the um, amount of energy it takes to wash the linens and things like that. Um, we try to place some supplies right outside the door so anybody passing by can hand something in. Yeah. Um, but still, even with all those efforts, it's it's just a tremendous amount of waste. It was uh, for anyone who wants to also do this. We used a really large room to collect. Uh, Latoya and her team taped it all off and made it sanitary and everything. But and I also just want to thank John and Christian for doing the really gross part. <laughs> yeah, I would estimate that it's like a hundred square foot room or something in that range. And I think if we would have allowed all twenty four hours of waste to be accumulated at once and then try to make through it. I'm not sure that we would have had the space to actually do it. Um, so I think doing it sort of in two stages with about half the waste at each time was really valuable and we got rid of half of it um, along the way. And just to emphasize what uh, Jen said about what the um, team on Phillips 21 has already tried to do with regards to waste. I, I, to me, we, we found almost nothing disposed of inappropriately. There was no regulated medical waste and the municipal solid waste. Um, there, you know, there was a small amount of, uh, there was a, there was some like unused supplies, um, but I think we found that people were, were pretty reasonable um, with the amount of waste that is actually going into this. Um, and it's just a, a, a systems level problem, which requires like systems level changes, i.e reducing the amount of um, contact precautions that are required and maybe uh, switching to reusable gowns as high yield um, opportunities. So um, is it two, oh, did someone want to say something? Latoya? I was just going to add um, to Christian that I did speak with materials management. I know that Ed Rake and team are working on uh, what it will look like for us to trans back, transition back to our reusable gowns. So that is something that is being worked on. Okay. And someone asked, um, how does reusing a gown, what does that look like practically? Is that something that just gets rewashed? Yeah, you just, you can still only wear it once. Um, you don't keep it, um, you don't keep it on or you don't, you don't use it, you know, once you leave the room, you take it all off just like we do with the disposable gowns. It's just that they're thrown into the laundry as opposed to thrown into the trash. So those are, are those, are we talking like the yellow cloth gowns? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. But I given what Christian found with the amount of water, I, that's what we always thought was that the, the amount of water and energy that was being used to wash these gowns was significant, but it sounds like actually um, making the gowns that have the you know, the plastic in them require a tremendous amount of water as well, which is surprising. Yeah, very surprising. I think it's um, encouraging, oh, sorry, I think it's encouraging too looking at some of these larger institutions across the country like UCLA that have not only been doing this successfully, but doing this successfully for years pre and during pandemic. Um, and not only looking at sort of the environmental impact of that, as well as the financial savings, I think it's really sort of a testament and a good benchmark that we should be able to set moving forward. One last thing that I'll say about that UCLA pilot is they looked at many different um, uh, like actual gown designs. And I think one of the issues that we encountered or that I felt I encountered on the gowns that we had historically used is, that were reusable is that they would get knotted up and then those get disposed of. And because the reusable gowns are much more energy intensive to create for the very first time, if you throw them away with a relatively limited number of uses, probably does come out as a wash um, uh, where there's no benefit uh, as compared to disposable gowns. In UCLA, I think they use like six different gown types and the ones that were most successful had buttons um, which were pretty uh, robust and um, didn't get knotted up and weren't disposed of at quite the uh, same rate that I, I think anecdotally we saw at MGH. And so I think the choice of gown is important. Yeah, we had a lot of, um, a lot of problems with Velcro and with uh, knotted strings, for sure. Thank you. That was so the main driver for transitioning was the knots that Christian is speaking of. Oh, interesting. Well, thank you so much, everybody. We're at time. Um, Patrice, I didn't know if you had a few closing um, comments. Thank you again to the panelists. Mm -hmm. This was terrific.
Thanks, Sue Ellen, and thanks to our panelists. We, we welcome you for next month's webinar. And please join us for the April 9th symposium co-sponsored by the MGH Center for the Environment and Health and the MGH Institute's Center for Climate Change. Thank you all.